Good evening, everybody. I don't mean the disciplined lot who are sitting. I mean that bunch in the back. Um, I want to welcome you all to this evening uh, of film. On behalf of the Center for Palestine Studies, I'm Rashid Khalidi. I am, for my sins, the co-director of the center. And I'm also the Edward, and it's a great honor to be the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies in the History Department. Um, some of you may know uh, the Center for Palestine Studies, which is in its sixth year, is the only academic institution of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. If you like what we do, we, we ask you to support us. If you're not on our mailing list, we ask you to join us uh, on that mailing list. Um, tonight, we welcome you to the second installment of this year's Palestine Cuts programming. We're especially delighted to have uh, the talented director, Ahmed Shoumani, with us uh, from Ramallah. And it's a long distance from Ramallah to here. Uh, Ahmed is, the, is a visiting artist in residence at the Center for Palestine Studies and the School of the Arts uh, for the rest of this semester. Um, you may know, some of you, how difficult it is to get a visa for someone from the occupied territories. Uh, and you can all imagine, if you don't know, some of the absurdities that are involved in getting visas, especially to the United States. We're thrilled to have him here. Uh, we weren't sure uh, that he would make it, but alhamdulillah, he has made it. Uh, a couple of words about Palestine Cuts. This is a new programming feature that we launched last spring. It's a space for filmmakers and video artists to present their work in an engaging environment. It promotes audiovisual projects that present critical views about Palestine and the Palestinians. It also hopes to bring Palestine-related work into conversation with other Arab and international filmmakers and audiovisual artists. Uh, we're gonna, we hope to do this, and we've begun to do this, through screenings, discussions, master classes, and workshops. Um, this programming, I have to say, um, isn't free. Everything we do is actually quite expensive, and we're very thankful uh, for the generosity of Jean and Kenneth Levy Church. Uh, I also want to thank the Journalism School, which has offered us this wonderful space, the School of the Arts, uh, which is uh, co-hosting uh, Ahmed Shomani, uh, Just Vision, who have been very helpful in getting uh, Ahmed here, especially Emma Alpert. Uh, I want to also thank my colleagues on the CPS faculty and student, I don't know, collective group. Um, especially Brink Messick, who does a lot of the heavy lifting. In addition to For My Sins being the co-director of the center, I am for my much, much more serious sins the chair of the history department. And Brink, who has three or four other jobs, including directing the Middle East Institute, uh, has done a lot of the work involved in this. Among other people who've done that, uh, that work are Hamid Dabashi, who's a professor of Iranian studies and founder of the Palestinian Film Project dreams of a nation. Uh, another person who's been very helpful is our Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow, Amar Ja'bari Salamanca. Um, I'm only up here to do one thing, uh, besides getting some of you to sit down. Um, and that is to introduce my esteemed and very distinguished colleague, James Seamus, who's going to be our master of ceremonies and will also help run things afterwards. Um, James is a, is a professor of professional practice at the Columbia University School of the Arts. That is a great distinction, but you should also know that he is an award-winning screenwriter of The Ice Storm. He's the award-winning producer of Brokeback Mountain. He is the former CEO of Focus Features, when Focus Features was a great motion picture production and distribution company. During his tenure, their films included Milk, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, The Pianist, Coraline, and the Dallas Buyers Club. You've probably, most of you, seen most of those movies. He is also an author. He wrote a book entitled Carl Theodore Dreiser's Gertrude, The Moving Word. And he's currently working on another book, which sounds very interesting. My Wife is a Terrorist, Lessons in Storytelling from the Department of Homeland Security, for which he has a contract from Harvard University Press. And we can't wait, James. Um, James also recently directed the documentary That Film About Money. And he just 
made his first uh, uh, feature directorial de debut with his adaptation of Philip Roth's Indignation, which I had the privilege of seeing in an advanced screening. It's an amazing movie. I strongly recommend it to you. Uh, James has a slew of degrees, a BA, an MA, and a PhD, all of them in English from UC Berkeley. We are very, very lucky to have both Amir, all the way from Palestine, and James, all the way from wherever he's coming from this evening, here tonight. So let me ask you to join me in welcoming. Thank you. It's all yours. It is a real pleasure to uh, be able to introduce Amr Shomali and this wonderful film to a very packed house. It's, uh, it's just so heartening to see what the Center for Palestine Studies is able to pull together on this campus. And there's so much programming. I mean, we just do so much. Uh, and it's great that so many people stay interested. Um, it's also uh, an honor to introduce not a filmmaker uh, tonight. Amr Shomali uh, is a lot more than that. He got his training as an architect uh, at Birzeit. Uh, then he went to uh, Bournemouth in England and got a master's in animation. He works many hands in many fields in many ways, including gallery art. He's a really a, a, a super accomplished and renowned gallery, uh, gallerist uh, uh, artist. He, he works in animation. He does children's books. He does just about everything there is that you can do with hand and eye and spirit. And, uh, and works out of a studio, not a studio, in, in uh, Ramallah now um, on multiple projects all the time. He's also ridiculously funny and incredibly warm and super smart. And he's doing something as a result of the hybridity of, uh, of, of talents and inclinations that he brings to the screen that means that filmmaking is not quite filmmaking in his hands. It's something more, and it's something uh, more challenging, especially when you think about what's happening in the world of documentary today. So on the one hand, this is a documentary movie. Um, and on the other hand, it's, uh, it's a challenge not only to consciousness of, and, uh, and received and stereotypical representations of the Palestinian struggle, but it's also a challenge to uh, received wisdom about what a documentary movie is. Uh, and that's one of the great things that you, I hope you'll attune to tonight, is that uh, Shamali not only registers a, a, a politics and a vision uh, that far exceeds the norm that we're used to seeing, at least here stateside, but he also registers um, a kind of protest against the norms that pocket certain people and certain struggles into the so-called documentary genre as if they're ready-made fits for a pre-established and pre a negotiated form of representation. So he's, he's bursting at the seams on every possible level. And he's doing so with the enormous humility and humor, but also underneath it, uh, a sly sense of, uh, 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 of uh, genuine uh, and rev revolutionary intent. So uh, uh, don't, don't uh, while, you're, while you're giggling and laughing, it's, uh, it might be easy sometimes to forget uh, just the revolutionary leaps that uh, Shamali is making on a regular basis, not only at the level of the image, but I hope also at the level of the political. Um, and with that, I, I think we didn't establish whether I mean, you're going to say anything before the film, or do we roll film? We're going to roll the film. Uh, we're going to be uh, sitting here in these extremely high ch uh, kind of bar chairs uh, afterwards, at least with my feet dangling fetchingly below me. Uh, afterwards, we'll have a brief discussion, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion from you guys for, for uh, a good half hour after the film, if that's OK with you. Um, enjoy the movie, and we'll see you shortly. The movie runs about 75 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, 75 minutes. Great. Take care. Have fun.
1987, I was just a kid. Six years old, living with my family in a refugee camp in Syria. Most of the time, we didn't go outside to play. Boring life. The only thing we could do indoor was reading comic books. In the Syrian camp, I knew that I'm Palestinian. And these are working, great. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, want to hear a little bit, about, a little bit about your journey here, but first we'll start uh, just talking a bit about the genesis of the film. I know that you were a comic book reader uh, when you were growing up in the camp in Syria, and there really was a comic book about the, uh, the 18? Yeah. Wow, and, and did, what, what kind of style was it as compared to what you ended up with in the film? Uh, it was more realistic uh, style, but um, at that time, I was obsessed with reading comic books. So basically, Tantan, Asterix, Lucky Luke, and some of the American ones, like uh, Batman and Superman. But for me, uh, uh, those Arabic comic books, especially at early 90s, they started to produce a lot of comic books about the Intifada. And one of them was uh, about Bet Sahur in general, about the tax strike, the civil disobedience, and about the cows. And I was fascinated. Um, in a way or another, this is kind of a different, uh, different comic book. This, those superheroes could be my relatives, could be my uncles, my cousins. So that means that me myself can be a superhero by bloodline at least. <laughs> so, um, and I, this image of this utopian place got stuck in my mind for the next, I'll say, 30 years. And it got me a lot of troubles when I uh, arrived to Palestine the first time in 1998 because um, I had this beautiful image of uh, Palestine, a utopian place where the young generation is involved and in, engaged and aware politically. And I arrived to a place after the peace where they were uh, obsessed with uh, consumerism, materialism, new cars, mobiles, and that's it. So I got really disappointed. I even ran away back to Syria three months later. Um, at some point, I met one of the characters in the film, and he told me that whatever you imagined about Palestine was true but you just came at the wrong moment, you missed it all. So for me, in a way or another, creating that film, interviewing those people of over five years, animating their stories, creating my childhood world uh, was um, in a way to relive the Antifada I missed uh, and share that uh, childhood uh, world with, with the younger generation. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up here in the States with a lot of comic books about tax strikes also. It's, it's no, yeah. But it's interesting that the blend of, of a political consciousness, a connection to a place, and you said realistic style, but this connection to childhood is so interesting. And of course, we're seeing young people, but it's, it's funny that, that children, per se, don't appear much uh, in the film, except uh, cows, children, um, like that. But something about that, um, that sense of childhood and, and, um, and wonder you know, permeates it. How did you make the transition when you took that story, you made that connection, and you've gone through this whole journey, artistic journey, what was the uh, uh, lever for the decision making to blend in the animation with the documentary? So the, the, the starting point was to have uh, uh, the story told from the perspective of the cows. Uh, I lived a while in Vancouver, I lived a while in, in England. I always had the feeling that the West is not ready to listen to Palestinians yet. So I thought that maybe they are ready to listen to cows. So I said, okay, <laughs> let, let's give this mission, mission to the cows. And eventually we can not deny that sympathizing with a cow is way easier than sympathizing with a Palestinian. So as if it's a Trojan cow, like let ask the cows to tell the story. And while listening to the, to the cows, you get a feeling of what does it mean to live under the occupation. So we asked real cows to act. They kept saying moo, so we had to animate those eventually. <laughs> Got it. And what was it like in terms of, uh, you know, you, you co-directed co with Paul Cowan, and, and um, it, it feels as if you were able to craft something uh, through the experience of making the film. 
How did it work in terms of the actual shooting of the documentary footage, the recreation footage, the drawings, the animation? Where did everything land in terms of the production plan? So basically this film took almost uh, five years of work. Um, the big chunk of it was financing the film and doing the research, writing the script. And the last two years were uh, shooting the interviews and uh, st we started the editing over uh, a full year where we uh, were doing the animation in parallel. So we'll, draw, uh, we'll throw on the timeline whatever animated scenes are ready. Um, but in the research phase, I started to, 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 to they got Paul on, on board. Um, for, for many of, on, on board, for, it was quite like uh, a risk to, to have uh, this very complicated film handled by a very no experience uh, filmmaker ever. So basically, we, uh, they got Paul on board. He's uh, around 65 years old, uh, experienced filmmaker but uh, a very classical documentary filmmaker. And I come from a different background. I'm a cartoonist, uh, fine artist. I do posters in general, and I use a lot of humor. So it was, and we are coming from different backgrounds. Like he's North American, never been to Palestine, never met a Palestinian before. And um, so it was kind of an interesting thing. Wherever I write something, he say, I can't understand what do you mean that I need more context. And he would write something and I'll say, for me as a Palestinian, this is boring. I know that already. So we kept uh, writing things back and forth to find a way to tell a story where the West will not feel uh, uh, alienated, so they have enough context to understand the story, and for Palestinians not to feel that this is a boring film, we already know that. Uh, and we kept also pulling the film back and forth between fantasy, humor, and comedy, uh, and a concrete, well-structured uh, documentary. You, um, the, the interviews, just the lighting and the framing is very stylized. When did you make that decision and how did that feed into the overall project? So also in, in, in almost every aspect in the film we were aiming for a comic book style. So we shot all the interviews on an angle, we tried to eliminate the, the background so we don't have uh, distractions, we tried to keep everything in the film kind of within the same color scheme, black and white and low saturation uh, thing. Dramatic lighting, one, one light from the side most of the time, which is very similar to the way uh, in comic books. Um, and um, we tried to keep the interviews as as intimate as possible, so you feel that this, this is you as an audience with this character in a room where it's only lit with one light and you are listening to this character in an intimate atmosphere. On the Israeli interviews, we did kind of the opposite. We did a white background uh, with a harsh lighting. Uh, basically, it's kind of similar to the atmosphere we Palestinians get uh, into the interrogation room. So usually the interrogation room is white, harsh lighting, so we kind of gave them the same uh, atmosphere of interrogation. So you, you made a film about the first intifada. Did you think that you'd be in New York talking about it while some people are saying there's a third intifada going on? No, uh, I, actually, I, I was not sure that this film is going to be made at all. Yani. It was a long process. Uh, we had a lot of problems along the way in, in producing this film. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, like um, nowadays, uh, especially with a third intifada happening on the ground. Um, like I keep saying, in the first intifada, uh, <coughs> You, if you Google First Intifada now on, on Google or YouTube, uh, everything you is, you're going to get is basically related to violence because the international media were the main people who were allowed to shoot at that time. And they were focusing on uh, the violence side of the Intifada. Uh, I'll say throwing stones, cocktail molotov, burning tires, shooting Palestinians, uh, and that's it. Uh, and you can't find this kind of stories uh, in the mainstream media or the non-mainstream media. This kind of stories are not told at all. So whenever a new generation is up there and they are frustrated and they want to do something, the, the images they know about the Antifada is the violence side of it. And it's a matter of reproducing over and over the same images they get. Wow. Um, on that, let's uh, open up to conversation and uh, questions. We have a microphone there and somebody has already figured out how this works. Uh, hi, my name is Amr. I'm an Egyptian filmmaker based here in New York. 
uh, we were warned before the film that we were going to jiggle and laugh, but actually it was the exact opposite. You managed to get us to shed our tears, so I actually thank you for that. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, first of all, the choice of Bissahur to me is quite remarkable because it's a predominantly Christian uh, uh, town. And uh, was that intentional, the choice to break the stereotype or even the propaganda that the struggle is about religion? Uh, second of all, uh, and since we're talking about the third uprising ongoing right now in the Palestinian territories, do you think there is um, a similar example uh, of Beit Zahor in terms of solidarity and civil resistance going on right now to what you have shown us on the screen? So choosing Beit Zahor was not like uh, a choice I made. I'm, I'm from the same town, so it was a personal story. Uh, but I'm glad that it, it also had this impact of uh, I keep getting this question in North America in general, that we never knew that there's Palestinian Christians. And I say, like, do you know, have you heard of Jesus Christ? Like, do, <laughs> can you point on the map where he was born? And some people say, yeah, 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 that's true, that's true, he was born in Palestine. And then I give them another dose of, of saying, do you know that we have a Jewish Palestinian community speaking Arabic and they live among Palestinians and they have Palestinian passport and they go to Palestinian schools and they also resist the Israeli occupation and they get jailed for that. And for them, that's too much to handle and they... And I'm not talking about any non-educated people. It was a screening, for example, at the State Department. They are the future, futuristic uh, diplomats of the US government going to the Middle East and they, they didn't know that. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that this side of, of, of that what, whatever is happening in Palestine is, has nothing to do with religion. It's more uh, a, a classical form of a, a colonial apartheid system, and it should be treated that way. It has nothing to do with religion. Today, for example, I was saying that it was, there was a demonstration uh, by uh, Naturi Carter, uh, a Jewish uh, group. Uh, Orthodox active, Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. So they were demonstrating in Ramallah nowadays. And, and nothing happened. Like, uh, it's not about religion, it's about like, uh, occupation. Yeah, the second question was... The second oh. question. Um, there is a lot of, uh, I'd say, non-violence activities happening on the ground, but it's not uh, organized the same way it used to happen in the first intifada. So there is, for example, Bilayin, Naalim, Bodros, and other weekly demonstrations, but it's not organized the same way in, in, the, in the first intifada. The first intifada was more like there was a critical mass of people mobilized and promoting uh, this. Nowadays, it's, it, there is less involvement uh, Thank you. Thank you. The mic stands alone. No, here comes somebody. Thank you. Hi. Um, at the beginning, I want to thank you for um, this amazing, um, motivating um, show, movie, or even thing. At first, um, my name is Arkanda Wood. I'm from Gaza Strip. I came here since uh, April. and. Um, the first thing I want to mention how, like some people maybe will not um, believe these things for the cows, for, but there is a similar thing that happened, for example, three months ago in um, a city called Atur. Um, once the Israelis arrested a man who owned a donkey um, for no reason, and um, he gets shocked how I get arrested for. I didn't do anything, I don't have guns, I didn't hide anyone. Then once he went to the police officer, or the, what they call it, and he told him that your donkey used to move childs to demonstrate against the Israelis. So the donkey even, the cows, the people. So that from the one side, from the other side, if we can't compare ourselves as animals, but actually, um, back home in Gaza, they deal with us as animals once they, as you mentioned at the beginning, that they control everything, the electricity, the water, the borders, even the breathing that they can't control. As you mentioned, they already control it as someone as me can't, couldn't go out of Gaza without permission after six or seven months from the Israeli side, or the Egyptian side, or from the Jordanian side. Um, how hard was it to go out of Gaza? How hard for the people who want to get a treat, 
treatments or just go to the hospital outside of Gaza because there is lack of medicines, lack of everything. Um, the second point I wanted to mention about the flag, how she mentioned, I'm so bad at names, how she mentioned how it was so hard to just to raise a flag um, on, in the public places. But I want to compare it to the people who were um, who were saying or about the, the rising of the Palestinian flag in the United Nations, how it doesn't mean anything, but it really it means a lot for the Palestinian that now there is people who cares about us, or there is people who know who we are, there is people who feeling what we feeling more sometimes the Palestinians themselves, and. Um, I wanted also to. So yeah, if you have the, you the have last, last question. Or yeah, I wanted thanks. to ask about this, especially about the flag itself. What is your vision? What do you think that your vision is after raising this flag in the United Nations? What is your vision? What is after? Um, okay, great. Can, let, why don't we have that answer that question and then we'll. Because I have a lot of points. Okay. I know, but thank you. We have other folks sure. too. Th thanks so much. Sure. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of the, the, the flag at the UN, and I see it totally different than the flag in the First Intifada, honestly. Um, uh, in the First Intifada, uh, uh, the interesting thing that people were not trying to ask a third party to recognize them and to recognize their right uh, and freedom, and they were trying to make uh, a, a fact on the ground. So putting the flag up at that time was very emotional, a brave step to do. Nowadays, I'll say it's, it's, a, it's a theatrical move. For, for me, personally, I don't know. For, for many people, it meant a lot. Maybe for diplomats around the world, it's something. But for me, as a Palestinian on the ground, it didn't make any difference. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Well, if it, if it hangs at the ICC, maybe it'll be a little different. Yeah. We'll see. And we have somebody behind you, Can sir. Sorry. Can I have Sorry. just a sim just simple well, question? We, another just simple question. Okay, when, yes. When, you talk about the cur when they talk about the curfew and the blockade uh, on the village itself and how the people deal with that. There is worse lack of food, lack of everything. So the same thing is now happening right now in Gaza and the West Bank. What else is your vision for the people? For how long do you think that they will stay in this <laughs> situation, just waiting for hope? So what do you predict from the people to do? What do you predict from the people to react, even in Gaza and the West Bank? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, a fabulous film. Um, I lived in Betzahor for about seven years, so it was really interesting to see all of them, to see it. Um, two quick questions. One is, um, is, there a, is there an Arabic version? Yes. And has it been shown in Betzahor and around Palestine? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, we financed most of the film by selling as uh, uh, like pre-sales to TV stations. And uh, there is something here that you can broadcast your film on public TVs in North America unless you have, I think, 80% of the film in English uh, because they think that the audience in North America is lazy and they are not going to read subtitles. So we had to make an English version and we have an Arabic version, which is the version being screened in, in Palestine. Uh, okay, and the other thing is um, this, uh, the, the tax strike, how do you compare that to the current situation with the BDS movement? Uh, so the tax strike was um, was a civil disobedience movement at that time involving Palestinians in in Palestine, and I think the 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 essence of it is kind of similar to the BDS. What's interesting in the BDS that it's giving a chance for the uh, individuals around the world to 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 be involved in the sense of the same way they got involved in, in ending the apartheid state in South Africa, they can also join the BDS to end the apartheid state in, in Palestine. I think that the BDS not only applies for, for, uh, for uh, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, case, it's the only tool for us, the boycott tool, it's the only tool left with us as human beings around the world to say something uh, regarding our, our life as, as a human being, I'll say. So you can all, also boycott Coca-Cola, you can boycott uh, companies that they have child labor, you can boycott anything that you want to make it different because that's the only tool left with us 
and I think it's the case with, with, with Israel. I think BDS is the only tool left with us as human beings around the world to bring Israel to sanity. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you so much for this beautiful film, an important film. And I have two kind of question remarks that might be opposite to each other. One, as part of the Just Vision film, all the time there is a strong promotion of uh, nonviolence resistance. But through this film, if you push it one more further, it's in a way it's explanation why maybe arm resistant is the right way. And nobody speak about that because today, every time the, there is the arm resistance, we try to tell to the West the story of the nonviolence resistance. But we see how it's failed in each one of the film that uh, I'm not advocate anything or not, but I said that the question of, uh, art of arm resistance should be important also how to deliver. And when I saw this film, and now I go to the other thing because I'm one of the person who promote from the beginning the cultural and academic uh, boycott, and suddenly I saw your film, I said, fuck, I want so much that Israeli will see it. I want so much that every Israeli will see it that understand that the reason we take in knives and uh, guns is because you never allow nonviolence resistance to really create something. And how can we show it if we support cultural boycott? So it's a question also of how we do the cultural boycott and find a way to, to create question in a society of the oppressor. So thank you. I think armed or nonviolence resistance is, is up to, I'll say, the Israelis in the sense of we want to end the occupation, we want freedom. So if we only send them an email and they responded, okay, cool, we'll do that, we'll send emails. If we have to demonstrate and then they said, okay, cool, we'll end the occupation, we'll do that. Eventually we're going to do whatever it takes to be a free nation. So basically it's up to the Israelis to decide. We are offering now the nonviolence, but you know, it's honestly up to them. Regarding the screenings in, in Israel, after our screening in, in TIFF last year, it was our world premiere. After that, we got an email from the Jerusalem Film Festival. Uh, they said that we want to screen the Wanted 18. We saw it in Canada. It's a beautiful film. And we, uh, we nominated uh, this film to the most prestigious award in this festival, which no Palestinian before got nominated to and uh, send us a copy. So we sent an email saying that we don't want to screen the film in this film festival. Uh, w w tell us when you start also to, to subtitle films in Arabic for the Arabic communities, uh, and we don't want to, to screen the film there. Uh, a month later, we got also another uh, nomination in Dokaviv, and we also said, no, we're not going to screen the film in Dokaviv. Soon, we are screening the film with uh, Zohrot. Uh, if you are familiar with the Zohrot, an Israeli uh, film festival, the, the title, the, the main slogan of the film festival is uh, Nakba and Right to Return. So that will be the first time we, we can screen uh, the film. In an Israeli film festival, we just ask them to move the screening to an, uh, a Palestinian uh, theater, and that will be the first screening in an Israeli film festival. So we have three folks in line, and um, uh, every, I know everybody's been uh, asking two questions, but maybe since we're just for one time, maybe one, one, one will do. Okay, uh, I've, uh, how did you get the two Israelis uh, to work with you and to be interviewed by you? I'm wondering what they're doing today compared to what they were doing in the past, because they seem to have some kind of like humor, maybe a bit of remorse or nostalgia of, of the time, and I'm curious what your relationship is with them. Uh, the old guy, I think he's still in the army. Uh, the younger guy, I don't know, but uh, they didn't change that much. Basically, the only thing funny he said that if he was a Palestinian, he will not pay taxes, but to his own government, which is a terrifying statement for me. Uh, it's funny, but it's a terrifying statement. Basically, if you break it down, he's saying that I know what, I'm, what I was doing there back then is wrong, it's unethical, but I kept doing it because I have orders which is like, I'm a soldier, I have orders, I have to follow orders. And, and we know that kind of statement led to what in the past. So how we got them in the film, basically, I didn't get them in the film. I mean, uh, they don't know that they are in this film. And <laughs> I kept 
kept I kept trying to get interviews, uh, those interviews, and uh, we kept requesting an access to the military archives to see the photos they have of the cows uh, and the reports they were filing, and they kept rejecting that application. Eventually, someone gave us an advice to submit a request as a Canadian film. So we submitted a request as a Canadian film. They said yes. So we sent Canadian crew directly to Tel Aviv. They did the interview, an hour and a half interview, talking about a lot of things, occupying the West Bank, uh, six, seven war, uh, managing uh, Bethlehem area, and the cows, and the, the tax strike. And we got the parts related to our film. So basically, I didn't get them into the film. I, I was not even able to attend the interviews because I needed a permit, and I, I can't get that Israeli permit to get into Jerusalem even. I, I tip my hat. So it's a trick and treats. <laughs> yeah, first of all, that's really impressive. Um, you mentioned sort of at the beginning of the discussion the ways in which um, stories of civil disobedience aren't really covered by mainstream media, and I was sort of curious how you think the media conversation has changed, if at all, over the many stages of this conflict. Um, and then also, what do you think people should do to create sort of a broader awareness of the many acts of, of civil or peaceful nonviolent resistance against the Israeli occupation? Honestly, I don't think the media changed. Um, maybe there is a minor little change happened in the past 10 years, but I think the, the main change happening in the and the, and the public opinion is uh, due to social media and the sense of, uh, of that the social media is kind of a democratized way to uh, tell stories. So it's not controlled by Fox, it's not controlled by CNN, there's no editor. You can just go there and tell what you think and post what, whatever you have seen in Palestine and there will be a discussion about it. Before that, I think the whole subject was, you know, you can't discuss the subject of Palestine. I, I, I admit there is a huge change in the past 10 years. The first time I came to North America, it was to Vancouver, 2005. On the way out, um, I gave uh, to check in. I gave her my passport. She looked at the passport. She tried to to check me in, and then she said, "I can't find your passport. Uh, what? Where is that from?" I said, "Palestine," and she said, "Never heard of it." And I say, "Palestine, like Palestine?" And she said, "No, never heard of it." I said, "Okay, try uh, Palestinian territories." She said, "No, not on the computer." I said, "Try occupied uh, West Bank." No, West Bank and Gaza, no occupied territories, no Palestinian territories, no. And she said, okay, where is that? I said, Middle, Middle East between Israel and, and, and Jordan for you. And she said, nothing is there, only a river. I said, oh my, and Palestine, sure, never heard of Palestine. <laughs> and we, we've blown a lot of stuff back in the 70s. And she said, no, never heard of this. So she asked, are you, are you Kuwaiti? I said, no, I was born in Kuwait, but because I'm a refugee, so I was born outside of Palestine. And she said, are you Jordanian? Because you are going to Amman airport. I said, no, but we don't have an airport. We had an airport and it was bombed. And she said, okay, uh, so I can't find you on the map. I can't find you on the computer. Uh, you was born outside, you don't have an airport. Give me something to believe that this is a real passport of a real place, like, otherwise I can't let you on the plane. I said, seriously? And she said, yeah. And she sent me back to Vancouver trying to get a, a letter from a German embassy saying that this is a real passport. There is a place called Palestine and you can let him on the plane via Frankfurt. Later, 2011, 2012, 2013, I started to go back and forth to Canada to work on this film. And I started to see stickers in, in, in the metro, in the streets, Free Palestine, Boket Israel, BDS, Israel is an apartheid state. So within the seven years, there was a major shift, shift between where is Palestine to having an opinion about how should things be there. So I think that there is a shift uh, in the public opinion, but I don't think there is a shift in the mainstream media. So we have time for these last two short questions and short answers. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, again, my question was relating to the Israeli narrative. I'm really glad you included that because I feel like it always, when you include both narratives, you give credibility to the story that you're trying to tell. Uh, in the future, are you, do you plan on telling more stories like this and in including both narratives to kind of bring people to the table? 
Um, actually, I don't see in this film that I brought the two narratives in the sense of that they are not telling their side of the story. They are you, have, you have the Palestinian narrative, you have the cow narrative. Yeah, the cow narrative, the Palestinian narrative, and there is the Israelis also saying that, yeah, that we did that. So it's, I, I see it more like confessions rather than uh, an Israeli narrative. Uh, so if I'm planning to do, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to do another film. So that's another subject, so we'll see, we'll see about that. Uh, uh, what was the first part of that question? I think that was Sam. Yeah. 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 It, and here's our last question for the evening. Um, Thanks. I noticed the appearance of a Temple Grandin book called The Cow, and I'm not sure if that actually exists, but um, I do know that Temple Grandin is someone who is very empathic towards animals. But I wondered in this case whether it was a metaphor, you had it in the film, because there isn't a book called The Cow, right? There is? By Temple Grandin? Oh, okay. Because I was thinking, I was actually thinking it was kind of a metaphor for, well, I know that she... It can still be a metaphor. Yeah. Okay, it's real. yeah, yeah. But I know that she has also worked for factory farms to figure out ways to make it, I don't want to say pleasurable, but to make it less, That's animals right. suffer less when they're going to die anyway. And so I, I did feel like there was a metaphor going on there too, um, in terms of the intifada and you know, giving up, um, and I just am curious to know. It's, it's a a metaphor. Empathy, empathy in the service of mass killing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a good business. Yeah. You are the first one to pick up this, you know, the first one. I'm glad you did. So back to the Israeli thing, by the way, I just remember oh, okay. the part of it. Um, it's quite a common thing usually in the Palestinians and the Israeli films to alienate the other. Um, I'll, I'll say a few, uh, let's say, talk about uh, Vals al-Bashir, for example. Even that a huge part of the film is about Sabran Shatela, the massacre, Palestinian getting killed, still the, the, the hero and the empathy, empathy is asked to be toward the poor Israeli soldier who witnessed that. So in the film, you don't see the face of uh, the Palestinian. So even when the Palestinians are get, you know, they get shot, they are getting shot inside the house, you see the blood coming out of the, the, the house, but you don't see their faces. So there is kind of no way to have sympathy to them. The only three times you see their face, the little kid shooting the RBJ, uh, screaming women at the end with a, with a high pitch uh, sound, and there is a little girl buried up to her head, and that moment, uh, that little girl reminded him of his own daughter in Tel Aviv. So he stole that moment of, of sympathy. And, and in the Palestinian case, I don't know why I should be afraid of having him and the film, like he, he told that he did those stuff. I don't, ha I don't have any fear towards the Israelis. I know that my narrative is concrete. I know that this is a true story, so I have no problem in bringing him to say that also. I was not asking the Israelis to give credibility to me, but I think for the Western, it's, it's something usable. Like when we also pitched the film for the first time, all the commissioner editors, they, they kept saying, no, this is a joke, this is not a true story. Because the f at the, f the beginning, I pitched the film to be a fully animated film. And they kept saying that this can't be a true story. This is a, an animal farm take on the Palestinian uh, situation. And they kept saying, no, it's a true story. And, and then we start to add interviews to the film. And I think adding the Israelis is part of that. It's weird how, how much we are, as Palestinians, uh, not believable creatures in, in the West. It's weird. So back to the starting point. Sympathizing with a cow is easier than sympathizing with a, with a, with a Palestinian. Amr Shamali, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for the film. Thank you guys for being here.